Since I've been working in Google for six years now, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we do computing and hosting in Google. Um, I started my work, uh, my career in Google as a network engineer, working on the global network, so I'm drawing a little bit of sitting with all the cool people who run the services, and, and that's what I'm uh, working on. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a time before even I started in Google. Uh, this is what uh, Urs Hölzler, who we talked about in the previous session, um, has posted on Google Plus just a few weeks back, and he actually dug out the first infrastructure bill Google got for their first virtual data center when they set up their, um, uh, their search engine. And you can actually see two megabits of internet connectivity cost $2,400 a month then. And uh, they got a super cheap price for only, uh, for only upload of 15 megabit, which was uh, $3,750 for 18 megabit. This was a rock bottom price at the time because he made a deal. Uh, most data into that data center was incoming. He said, when I'm gonna crawl the web, I need 15 megabits to crawl the whole web at that time, 1998. Um, so I need a very low price for that because all the, all the network interfaces were bi-directional. They had some free capacity there. They gave, they, they gave it to Larry for $3,750 a month. Um, anyway, this is how Google started building infrastructure. And it was quite hard to do. You had to put up your own servers. Uh, you can see they got their own virtual data center there, but they had to put in their own servers into, into racks, and they had to network them up. They had to connect them to each other. And every now and then something would fail and someone would have to drive to Palo Alto and change these things out. And that's what was happening. Um, then, but once Google grew, failure kind of became the norm. Now, well, even if you, you learn to do, okay, all, only buy the best stuff, only buy the best hard drive, don't buy any low quality stuff because you wanna have to change that out all. But even if you buy hard drives, which have like a 10 year mean time between failure, once you got 100,000 of them, that means one hard drive fails every hour. And once you got more than 100,000 of them, well, you have a few people running around and changing these things. And we do have a few of these people running around. But anyway, we can't rely on something not failing. Failure is becoming the norm, so, so we have to work around that. Um, and even worse, People is even harder. Like uh, even back then, it was hard to get good people. Now it probably became even harder, and that's the scarcest resource we have in Google. So we had to work around relying too much on people changing things as well and waiting for these people who swap these hard drives. So we built solutions around that, and our solution is planning for failure, not waiting for it to happen. This starts with the hard drives. We run our reliability in software, not in hardware, so anything which happens um, runs, on the, uh, runs on the stack, any hard drive can fail, and the file system takes care of it. That's where Colossus comes in, the Google file system comes in. But we also plan for failure on a higher scale, like we have a yearly disaster recovery testing within Google where we simulate all kinds of failures, like a power outage in a data center, although it really never happens, or um, zombie attacks we did from time to time, just to be covered if anything happens. And it's always loads of fun to run these tests, but we actually run them on the production systems and you don't notice. That's, that's the cool thing about this. We're always a little bit scared, but so far nothing happened. So uh, that just shows how, how we work on these reliability. Um, so we invested in all of those layers of, of creating reliable infrastructure. Um, and we built this huge platform, this toolbox for our developers. They can deploy applications easily in a containerized fashion. You kind of always have to define how do you want your application to look like. Even if you don't run standard libraries, you have to somehow put them in a definition and put them in, uh, uh, put them in a container so, you, so it knows exactly what gets deployed, what happens if X fails with which other services does it interact, et cetera, et cetera. So we have uh, defined software infrastructure, and that's what our software engineers tool do, and that's what we call the Google platform. And now with the Google Cloud platform, we're externalizing that. And we had talked about quite a few of our services, BigQuery is externalization of our Dremel tool, and 
um, up engine has been used internally before it was externalized as well. It's used a lot inside Google. So it's the same what you get is, is what we get as well. And we're continuing to externalize more and more of our tools to everyone else, while at the same time also saying, okay, people want to use the open source tools they used to, they don't want to learn the new Google stuff, so we're trying to support that as well. But integrated in our platform that it gets easy to deploy, easy to maintain, and easy to run. So it's the same thing for you as for us. Um, one more thing I want to talk about is the network, Google's global network, because I worked on that. Um, what you see here is only the network between our major data centers, and that we run today as a software-defined network between the data centers using a, a OpenFlow, which is a standardized uh, uh, toolkit uh, which was developed at some research institutions at Stanford, etc. And uh, OpenFlow, well, all the router vendors were looking at it and were saying, oh, then suddenly some dumb switches can kind of do all that routing logic we built. And they were a bit slow in, in, in starting to implement it. And people said, oh, this is maybe ready in five, 10 years. And then two, year, two years ago now, Google went to Stanford to one of the conference and announced actually our internal network runs on the OpenFlow stack already. We're running all our data between the data centers in OpenFlow and it helps us manage our routing better. We can use the full bandwidth of our pipes. We can control by our software integrated with our network when data runs from A to B. And so we can do copy, uh, copy jobs whenever there's a little bit of uh, free space in the network, et cetera. So, so we integrated that and, and that is another way of showing how Google keeps innovating. Um, but there's still one thing which, so far, if you use Compute Engine, you get IAS. If you use App Engine, you get Platform as a Service. You get either the full flexibility, you run your code, but you also have to upgrade your Linux. You have to install your databases. You have to monitor your machines and all of that. Or you go all the other way. You go Platform as a Service. Everything becomes great, just as we showed it but you lose a little bit of flexibility. You might, not, you might not be able to run all the libraries you want or all the languages you want. And we think really it shouldn't be that way. So we're thinking of a next generation cloud where things are automatically managed and they're open, but you're also flexible. And so you can be productive in any way you want. We see this continue between the two. So it should be Platforms as a service, infrastructure as a service, there should be something in between. And the first step we're taking is something we call managed VMs. So it's managed virtual uh, machines, which gives you the flexibility of uh, compute engine, but it also gives you native resources and machine types. And you get all the high availability, you know, from App Engine, um, and you get the automatic management, but you get the power of Compute Engine and the flexibility with all the libraries you want to use on the back end. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more how that works. And you can still use all these great tools we showed in the demo, like the, the Git repository, etc. So how does it work under the hood? Um, you start with your VMs. You have the VMs, the OS installed, but since we will deploy these VMs for you, we will manage that for you. So if there's an update, um, VMs get taken out and new VMs get put in with the right OS on it. Um, so we put in some extra layers to it. Monitoring, health checking, we do that for you now. You have access to all the App Engine uh, tools like the Cloud Data Store, but also our App Engine Man Cache and the task queues. So you can use all the App Engine services from within your compute engine. And how do you do that? We actually run uh, application server for you in terms of if you're a Java developer, we run a JVM, and that runs on these virtual machines. It's also set up by us. You don't have to care for that, but you can integrate your code and any third-party libraries you need. So if you're using App Engine, suddenly there's no whitelist anymore of Java um, libraries you can use. You can use any that you want. You can write to the file system. Obviously, you need to think any of these machines can go away at any time, so you should persist your data, but any of the libraries can run. And then we put the power of the App Engine load balancer to it, so all these VMs start serving requests when, whenever they're ready and when they're healthy, 
they get the requests from App Engine. And we do the version management uh, and the tracking and the logging, et cetera. The next thing I want to talk about is something which is a little bit more towards infrastructure as a service. If you don't want to use App Engine, maybe you don't use one of the languages we support. Maybe you don't want to run an application at all, but a database or something. That's replica cool pools. And that's what basically that um, MongoDB cluster we showed earlier is set up on. And that's in preview, early preview right now. But if you're interested in that, just see us after and we can see if you, we can get you into that trusted tester as soon as possible. So what do you do with replica pools? Basically what we've been go doing Google for years. You define how you want to run your service. Okay, I need a database. I need it to have four servers. Um, four servers make up one database which can serve X requests and I need four core machines and I need these packages installed and et cetera, so on. So you define what you need to run a service and we create the VMs for you, we destroy them and we load balance uh, the, uh, the requests. So you just put in a YAML file similar to App Engine, but in, on the back end we spin up machines, machines you can manage, machines you have full access to um, and, and we create the disks from an image you create, you have pretty much full control over it. So that way we kind of created a spectrum. You still can use Google Compute Engine. If you do some high performance computing and you wanna try it out or the first time or you just need one server, you wanna run, I don't know, you wanna run a testing application, you just need to try something out with Jenkins, you wanna install some packages, you can just log in on, on Compute Engine and get started. Um, but then you can use replica pools once you get a little bit more serious, once you wanna do something always defined the same way, you want a little bit of management layer on top of it. And we do the provisioning, we do the health checking for you. So if your machines are not healthy, we spin up new ones and load balance your requests that way. Now, if you want us to do a little bit more, you spin up managed VMs and we do the deployments, we manage the OS, the updates, we manage the logs. You can see the logs during our console and filter it in our console, et cetera. And then you can run an app engine managed runtime on top of that and we manage the whole serving stack. So I'm gonna demo this, actually the, the whole stack, managed VMs, um, and I'm gonna use Sudoku as an example. All right, anyway, um, who here has ever solved a Sudoku? Nearly everyone. So does, does anyone not know what a Sudoku is? Do I have to explain how to solve it? No, nobody. So I will skip over that. Um, we want to solve Sudokus today. Um, and actually, it's a problem. It's been done before. Like solving Sudoku puzzles, there's uh, Peter Novik who wrote a paper about this. He's an expert in machine learning and AI. And he said it's actually quite easy. It doesn't take a lot of math. It takes like one page of code. And so he wrote this Sudoku solver. He wrote it in Python so we can pretty much take that and put it in a, to App Engine. I don't need managed VMs for that. But I don't want to enter in the Sudoku grid I put and then click on solve and wait and see the results. That I actually want to solve Sudoku. I bought the newspaper today, The Guardian, and uh, there's a Sudoku in there. Today it's a hard one, luckily. So it, I would take about an hour to solve that. Now, if I don't want to input it in, there's a cool tool called OpenCV Computer Vision, and that allows you to see a, uh, in an abstract way things like a computer see, sees it, uh, like a human sees it. And the problem with that is it uses a lot of C++ libraries. Even if you use Python OpenCV, it needs all this stuff on the back end. You need to install a lot of packages to get that going. So that wouldn't easily run on an app engine. We need to have a virtual machine for that. So how do we solve this? Um, we're gonna take managed VMs, which I talked about, and those will be our backend workers. We're gonna put a simple app in the front end, which runs the whole capture the image and show me the results, etc. And then we put that image we capture in a task queue, give it to the backend workers, and they give us back the results of uh, what's in that Sudoku. 
And how do I do that? I have two modules, one for the front end, one for the back end. Front end is pretty much like it always was in App Engine. You have a simple application, it uses Ginger, it uses uh, Web App, etc. On the back end, the, the one thing which is changing is you put in one line which is called VM true. And that means don't deploy it on a regular app engine, deploy it on a compute engine uh, node. And then you have VM settings in the, at the bottom where you can say, oh, what type of machine do I want to run it on? I run it on one core machines because actually it's not that difficult to do that OpenCV stuff. And I need to install that package Python OpenCV with all the dependencies. And so it's going to install all these 40-something uh, packages it needs to do that computer vision stuff. And then I just tell it which URLs it should solve. So once I built the app, once I built the front end, the back end, I deploy it the same way. I deploy it together with gcloud app update or through the git. Works the same way. And then once we're there, we can actually show it live. And because it's always mobile first, we're going to show it on the mobile again. All right. Can we switch to the mobile phone? Yeah. This is actually live, so anyone can use it to solve any Sudokus you can solve. <laughs> so let's try to get a good picture of that Sudoku. Yeah, that looked fine. Let's hope it catches it. Click solve. <laughs> so, now I just need to put the numbers in the paper and <laughs> impress my wife at home. All right, back to the slides, please. Yeah, so that, that's basically how it works. We pull in the picture from App Engine, put it in the task queue, pull it from the backend in the VMs. They get spin up. Uh, we, we defined how many instances of those we want spun up. And then we put it back to App Engine. Now, what if 42 instances or whatever I, def I defined is not enough? Well, there's a simple way, you can install the modules API, you can use that from, uh, from your code, and you can set the number of instances while your code is running. Let's say the VM notices it's, it's, it has too much load, you can just spin up more instances, or you can shut them down when you don't need them anymore. So you can also automate that. Now that's cool, I think, um, but many people still think App Engine, hmm, maybe not for me, I have heard a few people in the break telling me, well, I don't really use Java. I don't really use Python, PHP, or Go. Some people use other programming languages. Who here uses another programming language than the four App Engine currently supports? It's about half the people in the room. So let me call some uh, programming languages out. I heard before Dart, someone uses Dart. Yeah, someone used C Sharp. Oh uh, yeah, also still there. Oh, more people use C Sharp. C++, anyone? Fortran, I even heard, yeah. <laughs> Erlang. Erlang, also good. So you wanna use App Engine, you wanna use all these tools we showed you earlier, um, but we can't really bring you 15 runtimes right now. We've, been, we've taken time to launch new runtimes. So, wouldn't it be cool if instead of runtime Python, where, where we built the code for you, well, we don't even need to compile it. So with Python, it's quite easy. With Java, we need to build it for you. And we define the environment, we install the JVM, and we run it, if you could do it. So this is what, what we're thinking of launching, and this was coming to preview very, very soon. It's that you just define instead of runtime Python, runtime custom. And we've internally tested that, and we run some of, the, some of the programming languages I mentioned. We tried them out and integrated them that way into App Engine. So basically, we just use three shell scripts to run those uh, type of applications, uh, to run those steps which we ran before for building runtime. You define those yourself. So you bootstrap your environment, so you install all the packages you need, et cetera, to run 
to run Node.js or Dart or Fortran or Erlang or whatever you want. Um, if it's a compiled language, you add a step to build. Um, so whenever you upload new code, we run that. And it builds your code, it, it health checks it, whatever you put into that, uh, it checks if, if the code is correctly built. And then whenever you, someone, we spin an instance up, we run the run shell script, and it spins up the JVM or the equivalent in all these other languages. So, so with that, we can, through a community, or you yourself can implement the runtime for Google App Engine, uh, while still having the full power of our our stack, you can use memcache, you can use task queues, you can use um, the, our data store, you can use our git push to deploy, etc. cetera. Um, we are also thinking, people are talking a lot about containers, about Docker. After, uh, we can think of putting that one step further and you don't just put three shell scripts, but instead you give us a Docker file which says how the runtime runs and we implement that on App Engine. So that one will allow you to code a little bit very free. So you can always access your data store from a data store uh, with the data store API. No additional authentication necessary. You have a cloud storage bucket which you can write to and read from, like from an App Engine API. You can use a memcache service which is set up for you and you can write to syslog and you can see it through our log interface and manage the logs that way. So that way, you can also use the Google Cloud SDK the same way we did, and you can update the code the same way we did, use all the tools which, will, which we have built and which we will build about App Engine, but with your own runtime. Well, or a runtime which the community has developed. And we built a demo, uh, which we showed last week, where the front end runs on Node.js and the back end runs on Go, and that allows very powerful applications. So any developer, any language you want to use should now be able to be integrated with App Engine with that. All right, thank you. Um, that was it from me. That's what's to come in, in managed VMs, runtimes, compute, which should you allow, allow you to run any kind of workload on Compute Engine, App Engine, or a combination of the two. Um, I think we have a little bit time for questions. Mm -hmm. So if there's any question from the audience about the content today. And do we have microphones? Perfect, we have microphones. Any questions? Yeah, yeah there's one. Just really simple, what's the Windows support roadmap and the CLR support roadmap look like in this, uh, in this preview and going out further? We have Windows running now in Trusted Tester on virtual, on GCE. Uh, I'm, if you're running something that can run on a Linux stack, so if you want to run Mono in the CLR on Linux, uh, interesting to see the uh, yeah, announcements. Like doing that, yeah. Just mean if in case maybe you can't. Sure. Yeah. So you, you you'll be able to use these tools today to to deploy things on Linux machines. We don't have anything in terms of uh, automation of Windows stuff. I, I don't know where that sits at the moment. So nothing yeah, to say on that. Community so. working on that. You made reference to communities, or is that something we should? All no, because we, we we just. We just announced that uh, last week and we've been internally testing it and we built a lot of very simple runtimes and we'll publish some samples on how a simple runtime could look like. And then we imagine that the community will take that further and, and build more complex runtimes on top of that. But I think it's fair to say that all the pieces are there to see and a lot of this is driven by customer demand as well. If we see a lot of people who are interested in this kind of automation on top of a Windows stack, then that's something that we could start talking about. So. And uh, Windows is in limited preview, which is one step further than Trusted Tester because it actually means we've committed to make this a feature which will go into public preview and eventually general availability. We don't publish timelines, but you know it from other features. Any further questions? Sorry, there's a mic coming to you. Uh, the results from the big data querying uh, uh, interface available mm -hmm. through open data format or something like that? Uh, what, which particular format are you looking for? Uh, open data, O data. Okay, so I, I don't believe so. Uh, you can generally get, uh, you'll either get JSON results or CSV, yeah. but again, it shouldn't be too hard to find an open source library that'll convert to that. There are connectors for, like I mentioned, uh, so things like pandas and R, which may have a native export to that, but I'm not familiar with that, so I can't comment, sorry.
Yeah, so you can also paginate through them with the API and then build your own exporter that way. Maybe someone did already. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, perfect. I think we're ready for pizza and beer, hopefully. Okay, so thank you all so much for coming today. If you want to come up and have a chat with us afterwards, we'd love to talk to you. If there's any questions about getting onto any of the uh, trusted testers or previews, then uh, do come and have a chat with us as well. Leave your card and we'll make sure that the right people get in touch. But thank you all so much for coming. Mm -hmm.